right, now we're joined by Lisa Pagosati, who's running for district court position one. So go ahead with the two minute introduction. Thank you, good evening. My name is Judge Lisa Pagosati. I'm running for King County District Court West Division, position number one. I've been on the bench for almost two years now. I was appointed by the King County Council, the unanimous appointment in 2016, and I ran unopposed. Since being on the bench, I've served in the Seattle Division, which is my elected division. I've also served in the Auburn um, Municipal Court, which is, uh, we con they contract with King County to provide judicial services. And I'm currently in Redmond. I'm very excited about being, presiding over the King County District Court's first community court. And um, very, very excited about that. Prior to becoming a judge, I worked in the criminal justice system for over 30 years, first as a juvenile corrections officer, then a juvenile probation officer, followed by over um, 22 years as a public defender. While a public defender, I worked in every practice division. I worked for Society of Counsel representing accused persons. My philosophy as a judge is to is very simple. I, I believe in treating every individual with dignity and respect that enters my courtroom. I believe in treating people compassionately, yet holding them accountable for their behaviors. I believe in separating the individual from the individual's behaviors. And um, I learn something new every day. I'm not afraid to make mistakes. I'm not afraid to call individuals out, um, actors in the system on bias. I've had the opportunity to do so, unfortunately, while as a judge. And I did so in open court, and I will do so again and continue to do so. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So now we have our four prepared questions that we're asking all candidates for district court. They're actually in front of you if you want to turn that over and read along with us as we read them aloud. Uh, two minute answers to these, and Ben, we need your number one. What barriers to access are there in the courts for unrepresented litigants, people with disabilities, and other vulnerable populations? And what steps have you taken to promote access to justice? With respect to unrepresented litigants, um, I see that as sort of a two part question. We have unrepresented, unrepresented litigants in small claims court which I've presided over, and that is sometimes very difficult because individuals do not necessarily understand the civil procedure. They don't understand the court rules. I take time um, initially to explain to everyone in my courtroom in a small claims environment what the procedure will be, how much time they have to present their case. I explain that there are rules that I have to follow. If they have documents, which often they do, um, I give them the opportunity to copy those documents uh, with our clerk. Um, provide them to the other side and look at the other side's documents as well. Um, I take time to try to explain the process. I explain, however, very clearly that I cannot give any advice. Um, this occurs in contested hearings, infraction hearings, as well as small claims hearings and protection order petitions. With respect to other vulnerable populations, um, it's very important to me that individuals are provided with interpreters and that sounds like a simple ordeal. However, sometimes it's not because I have individuals coming before me who, whose first language may not be English, but they speak English pretty well. And I have to walk a very fine line of explaining that I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I want an interpreter provided because language in the legal system is very different than talking on a day-to-day -day basis or talking in your work environment. And individuals who whose first language is English don't even understand the court system. So I try to be very compassionate in that matter, but very um, sort of strong-armed and, and insist that an interpreter will be provided. Um, with respect to individuals who um, are disadvantaged socioeconomically, um, oftentimes are faced with fines, fees, and costs, and have been um, such that they can't afford, and I waive those fees when I can. Great. And I forgot to look at the time, I apologize. That's all right. Uh, Clayton, number two. <clears throat> what state or federal Supreme Court decisions do you disagree with the most? I will say most recently, um, Supreme Court decision concerning right to work is something that I feel very strongly about. I've been very active previously prior to my current job in unions in all of my previous positions. So I'm very sensitive to the 
free rider, in quote, um, challenge that unions will have based on the decision um, that came down with the United States Supreme Court. So that's one piece in my head. Okay. Thank you. David, number uh, please describe your beliefs around the concept of restorative justice and whether you see a potential for judicial action from the bench as influential on that process. I absolutely do. As I indicated, I currently preside over King County District Court's first community court. Um, I believe in restorative justice for my soul. Community court is just awesome, for lack of a better term. Um, we hold court in the library over in Redmond, not in a traditional courtroom. I'm mm -hmm. sitting at this level, I'm not sitting above people. The idea behind the community court is we identify what someone's um, immediate needs are, um, provide them the services. I've got service providers on the other side of the wall from me in the library. We've got 10 to 15 service providers every week. Um, individuals have the opportunity to have their case dismissed if they connect with the services or sometimes it's community service some people have different needs we try to individualize those needs get people hooked up divert them back out of the criminal justice system because I believe traditionally in the criminal justice system we've tried to fix problems that we have no business fixing and we haven't done a very good job at it namely substance abuse issues mental health issues and so the community courts I believe um, provide a forum for healing, but also allow people to be held accountable to the community. And I believe very strongly that the community service needs to be provided within the community where the crime occurred. I'm also very, um, feel very strongly about um, peacemaking circles, which we, the juvenile court is the first court in King County to implement that process, but across the nation, and internationally, a lot of courts are looking towards the peacemaking circles where um, the victims can participate, the community can participate, and I believe it is a true healing process. I'm hoping to be able to preside over Veterans Court next year. That decision hasn't been made final yet, but Veterans Court and Mental Health Court. I believe that individuals, if provided with the appropriate services, can again, be held accountable and heal the issue that brought them to us. Call number four. Um, please share an incident or aspect of your work history that has changed or enhanced your interpretation of the law. And are you referring to my entire work history or? <laughs> I've had the, I considered an advantage to have worked in a variety of different forums within the criminal justice system. And I believe that working inside um, juvenile detention, inside that jail, I was able to see um, what jail can do to people. Um, as a public defender, I was able to experience um, individuals coming into the system, going to prison, coming out of the system. As a dependency lawyer um, for the public defense, I was able to see also how um, contact with the criminal justice system can affect not only the individual, but the individual's families and the community as a whole. So I believe that's where I gain my compassion, but on the other hand, I'm also um, not afraid to hold people accountable. And I'm, I think I do that well. Um, and again, I learn something every day. I will share an experience that I had with an individual this year who was on before me for a review hearing. He'd come many times. We had talked about what he needed to do, what was going to happen if he didn't do what he needed to do, and I gave him every chance to do what he needed to do. He knew he didn't do it. He still came to court knowing full well that he was likely going to go serve the jail time that we had talked about three months prior. And I gave him the jail time. He knew he was getting it. And the jail officer, or the King County Sheriff that transported him to jail, came back into court after and told me, that the individual shared with him, he said, I'm not, I'm not angry with the judge, she was fair. And that meant a lot to the police officer who's often had dealt with adversarial situations. Um, so I believe that if one follows procedural justice and people understand why you're making the decision, even though they may not agree with the decision, they understand why you're making it, the individuals can accept that decision. So now we'll open up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. We'll start with that. Yes. Do you support the construction of a new youth jail in Seattle? I 
can't touch on that a lot because um, it's somewhat of a political issue. However, I will indicate that there, there are a group of individuals, namely 16 to 25 year olds, even 18 to 25 year olds, who are being held in King County Jail in the adult system and I believe would greatly benefit from an alternative if they need to be locked up. And there are some individuals who are a threat to community safety, um, who need to be incarcerated for whatever time that is. I'm not gonna make that judgment without a case before me, but I would like to see a different facility for that group of individuals as opposed to King County Jail or the <coughs> Regional Justice Center where they're sitting and not getting the education they have. I also would like to see a facility where there's one-stop shopping with respect to services. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions? If you were in charge of this building, um, <clears throat> in charge of the process of, of uh, the new uh, facility, how would you structure um, the involvement of various parties uh, such that the, the resulting building was maximum of compassion into the people who have to go there and the people who have to work there? So with respect to involvement of the community and service providers? I'm, I'm, refer of I'm referring to the process in putting the building together called programming which occurs before the design process. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the process of documenting the intentions of the various parties with respect to the contents of the building. And gets also gets very specific. I would design it such that architecturally, and this may sound a little crazy, but it's being done across the nation architecturally that the building was designed in such a manner that promoted healing and there are architects that actually work on healing spaces for um, incarcerated individuals or community service centers. I would early on engage community service providers. It's what we found with what we're finding because community court just opened in King County what we're finding are that the community service providers are thrilled to be able to be in one space and provide services because they can collaborate with one another um, with respect to an individual. So I would have those service centers and space set up for the primary caretakers, for lack of a better term, in the community that would be providing the rehabilitative services. Additional questions? Seattle prosecutors are seeking to vacate more than 540 convictions against people carrying or caught carrying small amounts of pot in the city before legalization. Do you support? Uh, do you believe this policy should be expanded to include other um, marijuana offenses? Other marijuana offenses that would now be legal. Correct. Yes. Great. Thanks. <laughs> All right. That's simple questions. enough. That was easy. <laughs> Yes. Um, can you please describe an uh, instance where you faced an uh, ethical dilemma and how you resolved it? Yes. And this, um, are you referring to my position as a judge? Just or in, general. in general. In general. I've had some difficult decisions. I don't know if I would necessarily call this an ethical dilemma. However, it would have been an ethical dilemma had I not taken the steps that I took to rectify it. Um, when I left public defense, I was working in the um, felony um, field, had a, a couple very difficult um, sex offense cases, and um, one individual decided to enter a plea of guilty to avoid possibility of life imprisonment without possibility of parole. Mm -hmm. The plea that he entered, there was one um, something that I don't think was explained clearly to him, and it was an error that I had made with respect to the law. Mm -hmm. And um, I was sick when I 
realized it. It was it was within 20 minutes after the plea, and I went immediately to the jail, explained it, said I'll withdraw my support. He'll withdraw his plea, and follow my sort of elected that attorney. He didn't want to, but that was that was hard. I was sick sick to my stomach. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional questions. So. Seattle and King County have been doing all these amazing, innovative uh, reforms in the courts, veterans' courts, restorative justice. You've talked about peace circles. Mm -hmm. In your heart of hearts, where do you see the court system and our justice system in 20 years continuing this trend, perhaps? I'm hoping that the jail population will go way down. I think we need to do more with respect to bail reform, and frankly, starting with the court rule. Um, there's a presumption of release for individuals that are booked on a new offense and are faced with charges. Um, I believe that we can effectively supervise people pre-trial while they're awaiting whatever the outcome may be. I believe if we do that and allow people to voluntarily participate in services while making sure they attend their court hearings and while making sure that the community is safe, that they can essentially be rehabilitated prior to even the outcome of their case. That's best for the community. In a dream world, we'll have these one-stop shop um, service centers and maybe people won't even enter the system. That would be my dream. So I have a question. You mentioned in your opening statement um, that you've called out bias in your court, in the yes. open court and that you'll do it again. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to give more details about what happened. Yes, um, two situations that come to mind very, very clearly. One was I was presiding over a pretty large pretrial calendar one day, and um, individual, two individuals back to back came into court, essentially both pleading to very similar offenses, theft in the third degree, very small amounts. One was a theft of a bottle of water, one was a theft of something under $100. First individual came before me, the prosecutor recommended credit for the five days served, close out the case, done, no probation. Um, that particular individual had a pretty significant criminal history, fairly recent felony history, okay. but I also know there's reasons and there's things that go on with negotiations and the judge doesn't always know everything there is to know, okay? So the second individual came up and theft of a bottle of water, had uh, one or two felony convictions on his record from probably 15 years ago, I may be off on the years then. Prosecutor was recommending some work crew and um, probation for two years. First individual before me was a Caucasian male. Second individual before me was an African American male, older, dying of kidney disease, prepared to go out of state to be with family. And I think my voice dropped about 25 octaves. And I directed, and I hadn't yet sentenced the first individual, and I made it clear to the first individual that I wasn't holding anything against him because I didn't want him to think I was angry at him for right. this deal he'd entered into. But I point blank asked the prosecutor what the difference was between the case that I just almost finished and the case you know before me right now, and she stumbled around and came up with something while well, I we needed to do this deal and we couldn't do this deal if I didn't offer to close the case. Um, I didn't say this is a white man and this is a black man. It was very apparent, I believe, and was confirmed by my clerks afterwards who were speechless and in support that it was very clear what my point was. The individual who was dying of kidney disease, I closed his case out, waived his fees and said have a nice trip and take care of yourself, sir. But it was very apparent to everyone in the courtroom what the reason was. Another case um, was actually a case of a public defender, and I'm probably more sensitive to the behavior of defense attorneys, and I'm aware of that. Probably more critical, because I've been one, so if someone's not doing something that I think should be done, and I'm not talking about case strategy, I'm talking about client communication, then I'm going to call it out. And I had an individual before me who had been in custody for two weeks. I had appointed counsel two weeks previously, I set the case over so counsel had adequate time to go visit the individual at jail, which is open 24 hours a day, by the way, and review his case with him. In the courtroom, it was very apparent to me by the actions of the defense counsel when he went over and said, oh, did you want to see the police report in court two weeks later? And the guy said, not really. 
oh, well, you might as well read it. And it was very apparent to me then that that individual had not seen his client. The client was African American. Um, and I called the defense attorney out in the courtroom and I said, sir, have you seen your attorney in the last two weeks? He said, no, I haven't. I said, counsel, have you seen your client? No, Your Honor, I haven't. I said, sir, I'm discharging Mr. So-and-so as your lawyer and appointing you a new counsel who can provide effective assistance of counsel to you. Mm -hmm. The lawyer wasn't happy with me, mm -hmm. um, felt that I disrespected him in front of all of his other clients in the courtroom, but I felt that it needed to be done and I don't regret what I did and I would do it again. Great. Thank you. Robin. Thank you. So we are about out of time. Do you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement? I can't stress enough, and I want to first thank you all again for being here on this hottest day of the year, but I can't stress enough how important it is for me that people experience procedural justice that are before me. I have a lot to learn as a judge, and my goal every day is to learn something, reflect upon the decisions that I've made, and try not to make the same errors again if I've made them. I believe very strongly in restorative justice. I just returned from the International Community Court Con Conference in Birmingham and learned a lot of new things. Um, I had the opportunity to tour the Newark, Brooklyn, and Midtown Manhattan Community Courts and um, was on a panel talking about big reform and I hope to implement something like this. Great. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You.